Und jetzt ein bisschen warten. Uh, hi everyone. So, it's been a while. I am doing another tea stream. Welcome everyone. Uh, today, as you might notice, there are some differences. On the one hand, uh, I'm not just streaming on Twitch. We are live on YouTube as well. And uh, the person who owns the YouTube channel we're live on is joining me for a tea session and a casual chat. I'm here with uh, Gabriele from Nanwoshan, a German tea shop. Gabriele, please uh, introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Sigi, uh, Guy Drinks Tea, for uh, this invitation. I'm glad to be simultaneously on two different channels and we will find out how these things work. Please give us a comment in the chat if uh, you can see and hear us uh, well. If technically speaking, everything is fine. This is the first time we do this uh, multi-streaming. Let's see what people say. But otherwise, yeah, I'm here. I am at the end of my uh, working week. As you see here, it's still light. It is a late night talk, but since I'm in the US, it is still uh, it's still quite bright. It is uh, 5 p.m. right now here. So I'm ready to, to have, uh, if you want, uh, a late afternoon tea. Yeah, my 5 I, p.m. Uh, high tea, my high tea with poor. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, staying a bit more true to the uh, idea of it being late at night. It's 11 p.m. here. Uh, I haven't had tea yet today, but I'm really looking forward to having some now. Uh, fittingly, both of us are going to have some poor today because that's always great to talk about. Uh, what kind of tea did you bring for this session? Uh, for this session, I have here uh, in Bingdao, our uh, Bingdao 2013, uh, Gushu Pur. And, um, and I was thinking, actually, what about uh, steeping a Pur in a baby guy one that I usually use for a dance song? Mm. It's something that I never do, but actually today I had a dance song during the whole day while, uh, while I was working. And so at the end I thought, you know what, let's try something different and I will steep in these. Uh, this is kind of 50 milliliters guy one. You mm. see how tiny it is? Yeah. The, actually, the, the, the bowl is even larger than the, than the guy one, actually. So I can put my guy one. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Very nice indeed. Oh, I see that also Gabriele from uh, Munich is online. Uh, hi, Gabriele. Hello. Yeah, we've we've got a bunch of people here uh, from the Tea Discord and from oh, really? uh, the Nanushan community. Yeah, it should be fun. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have a view on uh, on the Discord chat and so on. So I have to I have to get uh, from you, uh, Ziggy. I'll, uh, what is happening there? I have I have a view here on the on the YouTube chat though. Yeah, I'll try to keep everyone connected. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, uh, I've got this uh, nice little Dragon Ball here. Let me see if I can show it on the other camera as well. Uh, this uh -huh, is yeah. Gödeng, supposedly old tree material, but who knows? I've had it a couple of times. It tastes very very good, and I'm glad I got it. So this should nice. make for an enjoyable session. So is that a Sheng? Yeah, that's also Sheng. I think we're both having Sheng today, right? Yeah, it looks relatively dark though, isn't it? Um, that might be in part due to my camera settings because everything's a bit dark right now. Okay, I assume. Um, it, it's not like actively green, but it's definitely not like the dark yeah. brown, like an HTT or anything like that. I think it's 2018. It is a light night session, so it's fine if it's dark, right? Exactly. All right. In that case... Uh, oh, also, Ward is... Uh, if I remember right, Ward... Uh, sorry, just greeting a few customer. Mm. If I remember right, you are from Belgium, I think, right? Um, so, Sigi, do you have already your bowl in the guy one? Or what are you, what are you using? Are you using... Uh, uh, I'm using this pot here. Oh wait, I, and I also just <laughs> it on the other camera, yeah, that's gonna take a bit of getting used to. Oh, uh, nice, yeah. Sorry, dear audience, this is um, a Zini pot, Zini, 120 yeah. milliliters, and uh, since I'm a bit of a clumsy person, I've had to fix it a few times, so there's some nice gold oh, stripes on there. Oh, that's nice. So who made that work for you? Uh, I did that. 
Really? Yeah. Surprisingly enough, it's not that difficult. Oh, that's interesting. So I, when we get, because sometimes it happens that customer break each in people, they contact us and they ask from whom we can do, you know, the repairing. We had mm -hmm. one person actually um, that was doing that in, uh, in Berlin. And uh, we have also a, a specialized laboratory in, uh, in Jindagen actually that does it. Uh, oh, but wow. those, they, that in Jindagen, they are really, really expensive, but uh, they are also very professional. Like you can even break an ancient teapot in many pieces and not being able to find some of those. They basically reconstruct also the pieces that are missing. Oh, wow. So it's, yeah, a lot, uh, it's a lot of, yeah. It's really, it's really um, a nice laboratory that we, we just discovered last year, actually, when we were visiting there. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, I am I'd, here I'd this to tiny to, table. Uh, Jingdezhen sometime, because it seems like a fascinating city with such a like, rich is. history. It is. And, uh, and actually, I would even, uh, I think I mentioned that in some video, that uh, when we do the, the tea tour, I mean, we don't do it right now because of, uh, of the COVID-19, but uh, actually we were supposed to, I was supposed to be right now in, uh, in China, actually. And uh, the, um, the customers from the, the subscriber that joined it actually for the tea tour uh, would have joined me in a few days and we would have gone only to tea plantation region. But I was, I would really consider maybe for the next year to do also not only tea gardens, but also go to uh, Jindagen, for example, because despite there is no tea production there, it's really a fascinating uh, city, as you say. Yeah, uh, for those of you who don't know, Nanoshan organizes a yearly trip to China for uh, friends and customers that you can participate in if you want to, where they uh, go to China and have a lot of tea related experiences sourcing tea i think even making tea didn't you make some uh yes ocean? yes we also um, we also make tea we have also actually on the on the stream on youtube we have uh, gabriele that actually uh was supposed to join us this year to china we even already booked the flight and then we had to cancel everything because of the coronavirus um but uh, that's correct we usually try to go in this time of the year because we want to uh, to experience uh, both green tea production and oolong production and mm. since the two are uh, timely uh, shifted there is only a, a few days every year where the two overlaps yeah and uh yeah and that would be basically um at the end of april beginning of may makes uh makes sense yeah i've i've seen uh i've seen some of the like reports and blog entries and uh i think i, I am. did a video on the yes, we did also. We did a short video. Yeah, I'd I'd love to go someday, but I think I gotta finish university first because otherwise it might be tough to get there. Um, but yeah, yeah, so we're drinking poor today. It looks like you're about ready to go. I uh, just got done. Yeah, almost rinse. there. I'm um, I'm thinking about how many, how much leaves to use because it's such a small guy one. Mm -hmm. But I think I will I will do like that. I will do a shampooer and I will brew it a dancing style. <laughs> so I will put, um, let's see, I will put actually almost five grams of leaves in this tiny guy one and do very, very short steeping. I, I, honestly, it's the first time that uh, I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, just had this idea today. Um, I don't think at all that shampooer is uh, uh, suitable for uh, a dancing style, a chaojo style gongfucha. Um, but uh, this Bing Dao is not uh, really um, a bitter pour, mm -hmm. so it should be actually uh, okay. Yeah, we'll see. Also, I'm sure th uh, there's like I think that there could there is a point to be made, like with how uh, poor processing has changed over time towards uh, poor being more drinkable when it's young these days. That yeah, maybe people could start experimenting more with other ways of preparing it. So closer to something like an oolong, or uh, maybe I don't know that maybe even lower temperatures or stuff like that. There's a ton of different things one could do. Maybe, yeah. 
Yeah, sometimes, sometimes I actually do lower temperature for poor. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something yeah I've done. But this type uh, of um, super tiny guy one, and on top of that without the pitcher, so just directly putting in the cup, is the first time that I try this out. And also, it is as you say that the the production a little bit might change and also adapt. To, uh, especially to the Western need, because more and more Western people start getting interested in poor. But also, starting the petal here, it's uh, it's where it comes from. Like uh, um, Bindao is in Linsang, and in Linsang Prefecture, usually, I mean, it's not it's not the rule, but uh, usually you have a little bit of a more spicy taste mm -hmm. and less bitter. Yeah, definitely. So. Uh, cheers, what is, um, cheers. So I, uh, I have a little bit of our time as usual, of course, to follow <laughs> to follow the discussion in the chat. Mm -hmm. But Matthias will uh, will write me in a separate chat if there is some uh, some question, and I will try to follow up there. Uh, Gabriele Zimmerman is writing. Bye um, in Shan Yeshen. White needle mountain leave Sheng, whatever that is. Uh, mm. Wild, that's wild. Uh, ah, Sheng for wild, yes. Ye Sheng, right. Yeah. We've had some uh, interesting discussions about Ye Sheng on uh, the Discord lately, mm -hmm. where like, we were talking about how there's different types of Ye Sheng with the uh, like naturally grown wild varietal, mm -hmm. the uh, cultivated wild varietal, and then other stuff that is neither of those two also being called Yesheng for some yeah. reason. That's that's a problem, especially also depending on the tea, I would say, because if you are in poor, in poor, it is more likely that when you say, my opinion, whatever, what I've heard, that when you say Yesheng, you really refer to naturally growing tree, although also there are people might refer simply to to plant that have been planted long ago and then no one has been taking care of them. Mm -hmm. So in German, I would say verwildete Pflanzen. Yeah. Uh, how to say that in, uh, like, in English? Uh, I guess it, it's kind of implied by just the word wild, wild or like uh, plants that have been left to themselves yeah. without any further like cultivation, basically. Yeah, they originally they were not wild, they were cultivated, but then over um, over the year they were just left. While in the on the east coast in China, where anyway the plants have been cultivated, when they use ye shine, they really refer just to it. And we have actually a few examples I can make. Uh, I remember once um, I've been visited uh, a, a garden. Um, it was actually um, for longing. They, mm -hmm. they were doing longing uh, more than uh, 30 years ago. Ooh. And then 30 years ago, they have stopped. Um, they've stopped taking care of the plants and they let them grow. So starting from bushes, they develop about three meters high. Wow. And, and the guy told me, uh, if you want, I can do a tea for you of, the, of these plants. So it would have been, you know, an option. He would have just said, the garden is here, we can use it. We just visited it. I have some pictures I should, should post them one day. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't go for it simply because we had already purchased Longin for that year. And on top of that, I would have got the uncertainty of the result. I mean, it's not always that Ye Sheng comes out good, right? So uh, yeah, it was a little bit too, too risky. That's very true, but that would have been really interesting to experience, especially because, like, at least from my understanding, uh, most green tea is usually harvested from fairly young plants, so... Who knows what it might have been like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And also, in some regions, um, I have at least two examples, uh, white tea in fooding and also... Um, traditional black tea from the northern of Fujian, they might refer sometimes to Ye Sheng or to, uh, they call it sometimes Tsai Cha, which means, uh, literally translated, means vegetable tea. <laughs> and uh, so Tsai is vegetables. And, uh, and uh, sometimes they use that to refer to uh, bushes that grows on the side of the street or maybe uh, not exactly on the tea garden, but a little bit far off. And mm. therefore, people don't really take care of it. 
And sometimes some farmers, what they do, they just go around, pick up leaves from these uh, side shop bushes and they make tea out of it. And since they don't know actually what is the original cultivar, they call everything side shop. That sometimes mm -hmm. is also a way of referring to a local cultivar for a from a specific place simply, yeah. Oh. So uh, Zealousy in Twitch chat just said that uh, in response to Yesheng not always being good that a Yesheng tuo he bought ended up tasting like pickle juice and uh, uh, yeah, yeah it, that's kind of been similar to my experience where Yesheng really needs like some time and some good storage before it really becomes mm. a nice tea. It's often quite like harsh, bordering unpleasant when it's young, at least once I've tried. But you're speaking now about poor, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm exclusively speaking yeah. about poor, unfortunately. I see, I see, I see. Because, the, no, no, that's fine. That's Of course, it's fine. It's just that if I think about Yesheng, um, yeah, if you tell me just the word Yesheng, the first thing that come up to my mind is a green tea that I had mm -hmm. a couple of years back. Very, very fresh, just, you know, out of the garden. And they sent us a, a sample, like a big, actually, a big sample to Shanghai. Mm -hmm and it was incredibly good and I wanted to have more information about the tea and the only thing that the farmer was saying is just yes, Shen. Like, <laughs> they, you know, they just didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. And I know that actually, you know, you guys and uh, all the customers, you always want to have as many infor information as possible yes. about the tea. So what do you do when you find tea and you have nothing, you know nothing about it, simply so tastes good? In, in some way, I think if it's an exception, then that could technically work. Like, if, let's say, that was the only tea on your store where you're genuinely like, okay, I've got no idea what this is, but it tastes fantastic and I want you all to try this, then that's probably fine. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be an option, but also you have, you have to uh, find something to write on the... Um, on the website, right? But I mean, maybe yeah. it could be a story, the fact that you don't know nothing about the team. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's an option. You know that sometimes it's not so easy when you are there and you think, I mean, think about uh, even going in a place like Yunnan. You mm -hmm. cannot imagine which huge choice you have of tea. Yeah, yeah. it's like, uh, it's, uh, it's not only when you go visiting a farmer, but sometimes uh, farmers have also uh, some someone from the family that have a shop in uh, in a city tea market. Oh, so, for yeah. example, you know, in Kunming there are many many large tea markets. So everyone, most most not everyone, but most of the owners of those tea shops actually produce tea back home. And so you, you visit this tea market and you have literally a thousands of different <laughs> teas, you, you know, you can mm -hmm. source and you can just pick one and then get a, acquaintance with uh, with the farmer and then maybe agree on visiting together with him, yeah. uh, the, the factory and so on. And is that you have this huge choice, but you have to limit what you can buy. It's very, very hard. Yeah. You have yeah. to go by feeling. Yeah. <laughs> it's a... Uh... We, we have a funny inside joke on uh, the tea discord that also mm -hmm. kind of makes sense in this context which we randomly found on some e website because uh, their tagline was taste never yeah. lie with the yeah. uh, lie instead of lies that's kind of what made it funny but yeah uh, I mean it's it's basically right like ultimately you can't you can't really decide before you've actually tried something. It is, yeah, it is. So, something I've been meaning to ask you is, since we're having Pua right now, and we, uh, we've already had a bit of a chat about Pua, what got you interested in Pua initially? What got me interested in Pua? Hmm. Well, I think that uh, to answer the is to answer the question, I, I would say rather poor came to me than the other way around. So the way I I got interested to poor is um, is when I traveled for the first time to Yunnan, but I didn't travel to Yunnan in search for poor. Mm -hmm. So or at least it was not the main the main reason. So basically, at the uh, is, we are not speaking about the very beginning of Nanoshan, we are speaking about what happened before that, yeah. basically. And uh, 
and there was uh, a time where I was, uh, as every one of us, right? We get, we go into tea and we start collecting information about uh, um, about tea. We want to to gain some more knowledge, and, and and sooner or later, every beginner, you know, realize and read about the fact that. Uh, the tea plant uh, most probably come from uh, the southwest of China, from the region between uh, Yunnan, um, Sichuan, uh, Burma, Myanmar, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and actually, I decided to go to Yunnan because I thought if I will do a first tea journey to China, I want to go where everything started. Oh. So I didn't went there because there was a poor hype, uh, not really, and it was not with me at that time, the poor hype. I knew poor, of course, but uh, uh, it was not the tea that I drank the most, uh, which is probably today the tea that I drink the most. And so um, it was a very adventurous, uh, very adventurous uh, uh, journey, actually, because uh, um, was I still a student? I, you know, I wasn't. I wasn't a student anymore, but uh, not much money, let's say. So mm -hmm. in, uh, flying to Yunnan is expensive because uh, you don't have direct flights from Europe, at least at that time. So you have to fly, you know, to the east coast in China, and then. So at the end, uh, I decided to fl to go to Yunnan uh, over uh, Thailand. So I flew mm -hmm. uh, to Bangkok, then I went to in the north of Thailand to Chiang Mai, and then from there I reached the border with the Laos. And yeah. from there, uh, there is a river, the Mekong River. I jumped on a boat that comes only once a week at that time. And, uh, and I stayed basically uh, on the boat for uh, uh, nine hours until I reached uh, Yunnan um, in the middle of the night. So that was my entry in Yunnan. That's and that, that's the way I came in, in, in touch actually with, um, with Poor. So uh, I didn't speak, uh, well, I, sp I spoke a few words of China, but it was really extremely basic. So I had a piece of paper where I had written, uh, um, I wanted to show that basically on tea markets and it was written mm -hmm. uh, who I was. And I was, I wanted to do an experience with tea farmers if they could bring in, me in touch with the tea farmers and I could spend some time at the farm. And so eventually that uh, succeeded. And that was my first true um, experience with poor because of course that the, it, was a, it was not a farm, it was basically a family house. And they were a family of uh, poor people that cultivated uh, tea and made poor and they just, uh, uh, they didn't have any, any way of pressing the tea. So they were just producing maocha. Mm -hmm. So, uh, by the way, Gabriela, you asked what is Malcha. I will get to that video, but here we're speaking again about Malcha. They were just doing Malcha and then they were sending Malcha and selling to the factory for pressing. Oh. And, uh, and they were keeping some Malcha for themselves and they were also selling Malcha. So at their house in the evening, uh, after we were out to work in the, in the tea fields, uh, we had only the opportunity actually to drink uh, extremely uh, bitter uh, matcha and i would say that in my mind is the most bitter tea i have in my in my head at all um it was wow it was maybe i was at that time not so used to bitterness like now but maybe, it was but really like, hard at the same time we are talking about freshly harvested poor here so i imagine and? it would be quite uh Powerful. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Oh, so what about you? What about you? How did you became uh, <laughs> a lover of poor? You know, that's kind of a tough question to answer because, realistically speaking, um, when I initially got into tea, I didn't like poor at all because I got some like loose uh, show poor from some local tea shop. Uh, that didn't smell good and tasted even worse. That was back in maybe like 2012, 2011, uh -huh. some time around that time, which uh, was also when I was getting into Sencha, which I really enjoyed at the time and still mm -hmm. do. And uh, yeah, so I tried that. I thought, okay, so that's what poor is. And uh, I thought I probably wasn't going to touch it again for the rest of my life. And uh, how wrong I was. So, <laughs> fast forward a couple of years, uh, it's 2018 now, and for mm -hmm. some reason, I'm not sure what motivated me, but I just got this 
thought in my head that I should probably give Poor another try. And I oh. did. And this time it turned out well, because I actually found out about like Shang and Cho, and I found out about storage mm -hmm. and about not buying garbage, etc. And uh, yeah, I've been hooked on it ever since. It's I've got more poor at home than I could probably drink in maybe a decade or so, and I've got yeah. which is a kind of way. a classic for poor lovers, right? Yeah, we are hoarders. And Heicha, actually. I mean, of course, uh, also because uh, by the gram, with respect to other teas, you can make better deals. So, especially other Heicha, uh, not only poor, you can really buy, you know, one kilo brick and uh, it costs you by the gram. This tendency of buying always large quantities with the poor and Heicha. Mm -hmm. And my greetings to Helena, that I see she's also online from München as well. Oh yes, hi Helena. Uh, but yeah, um, I think having, or like usually having to buy uh, HR in such large quantities can also be a thing that makes people kind of shy away from it. Because committing mm -hmm. to like a full 357 or 400 gram bing yeah. uh, is more money up front even if the cost per gram is lower it than is. that of yeah. let's say most like Yancha. And that's why you have got this change recently of introducing also smaller uh, bing chas like the mm -hmm. 200 gram and the 100 grams that up to just few years back were impossible to be found in China. And actually, that's also the reason why we started uh, breaking cakes ourselves. So just until, uh, I would say, two years ago, we were only selling full bing chas. And then we realized, we realized that people would like to try some samples and also buy larger quantities. And so we, we introduced it basically a smaller portion and we break the cake uh, uh, for you. But that's, uh, that's definitely a Western thing. No one in China would ever come up of asking of going to a tea mm. shop and asking them to break a, to break a cake to buy just a portion of it At the and the prices time, are as high as here something i have noticed uh with my like ordering straight from tea mall and stuff is mm -hmm. that uh one thing vendors will often do is they'll send like a 10 gram sample of the tea you bought along with it because they know that most people are just going to put them straight into storage so yeah that way you can also have a sample that you can try right away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. And uh, one thing I meant to ask with regards to the whole sample thing, would you say that, like, the amount of poor you've sold on Nanuashan has increased since you started doing samples? Definitely, yeah, 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 yeah. No doubt. It has been increasing uh, uh, a lot. Not only, I mean, we can call it sample, but basically what we do is uh, all our poor, we sell also 50 grams packages. And for the most expensive one, we sell also 20 grams. Mm -hmm. And anyway, you have the possibility for all these to buy the six gram uh, samples. So that's the way uh, we do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and uh, well, we sell also full bean chas, but we definitely sell more more often uh, uh, pouches of these. Yeah, pouches of poor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Like, how is your tea? It's really nice so far. So one of the things I appreciate about Göttingen in particular, it being like an area that's adjacent to Iwu. I think it's mm -hmm. like in the northwest, if I recall correctly. Say the name again. Göttingen. Uh -huh, yeah. Uh, there's something quite special about it to me because on the one hand you get uh, some things that people would associate with an Iwu tea where you've got a lot of pleasant flavors, a lot of sweetness, a nice texture, it mm -hmm. feels good. But then at the same time you've also got like a fairly uh, potent, maybe not potent, but like fairly prominent bitterness that yeah. provides a really nice contrast to all of the EU-like stuff that he is giving you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I see. I see that, yeah. And it depends also very much really how you prepare it. You say you have 120 milliliters teapot, uh, you're using an Ishin, which is smoothing anyway a little bit down 
Mm -hmm. they, they, how much they did you put in there, more or less, you know? Uh, I'd say this ball is maybe around seven grams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and that that's kind of my usual ratio. So I, I've been using this pot for the most part lately. I've been doing seven grams of uh, sheng in it, regardless of whether it's like young or old. There are some mm -hmm. where I do like a bit more. If I know the yeah. tea and I know it needs a bit more, but... Uh, and with that, I tend to do somewhat longer steep, so... I feel like we're kind of doing opposite techniques here. You, you're you going for a lot of really quick steeps today, and uh, I'm going for slightly slower yeah. steeps. Well, it is... Uh, uh, look at the guy one. I, I try to get closer yeah. uh, to the camera. I don't know if that works. I mean, you mm -hmm. will see it uh, dark, but at least you can see how much there is inside. It's really full yep. um, of tea. And um, so for the first time, I am experiencing this uh, Bing Dao as uh, very bitter, <laughs> no matter how short I steep it. <laughs> and it has also some, some uh, salty mineral notes to it Ooh. that are also a little bit new. So I definitely, with this uh, a new way of steeping it, I get uh, um, new notes out of it. I'm not sure that is the way I like to brew this tea. But nonetheless, it's interesting for, uh, at the very beginning, it was even earthy. And uh, I mean, it's not oh, wow. too old, it's seven years old, but it had uh, some earthiness to it, yeah. That's really cool. Um... And it's kind of, you know, this, this salty feeling that you have when in winter you drink a salty soup? A whole oh yeah, hot, yeah, this yeah, like that... briny kind of impression. Mm-hmm. It's... Yeah, powerful. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, so regarding ratios, uh, something that I've come to believe is that uh, scaling, like scaling your T ratios to your vessel size and scaling your steeping temperature isn't really like a linear thing. So for example, mm -hmm. if this were a 60 milliliter pot, I couldn't do 3.5 grams and do the same steep length because yeah it doesn't quite work like that yeah um, yeah that's uh yeah i see i see your point and uh um, i think if you would like to search for an analytical explanation of that uh, you can write a phd thesis on it <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> um it's definitely there, there, I mean, there are some. I, I definitely agree that you cannot go uh, linear. Um, even even if you if you use uh, just if you want to get a little bit more technical, but even if you use exactly the same shape. So let's pretend you have two guy ones. They are identical. Actually, we have. I don't know if it's uh, is sold out or not, but we have another guy one that is identical like this one. Even mm -hmm. the, the same kind of porcelain is just like more than double the size. But even if you have exactly the same shape and you do as you say, you just steep the, the ratio accordingly and uh, you steep for the same amount of time, you don't get exactly the same taste out of it. But just to mention one thing that is different is uh, the way that uh, the taste from the leaves dissolve into the, the water because uh, a, a major, I know I'm getting technical here, so, but just mention it, the technical contribution to uh, the, the speed of diffusion of flavor from the leaves into the water is uh, a thermal uh, convection in your vessel. Mm. And uh, so thermal, so natural convection means that simply since one side is hotter than the other, it starts, you know, the water inside starts moving. And if the pot is very small, just, just scientifically, it's too small to create convection cells. So uh, water is not moving at all inside your guy one. But if you have a larger teapot, you can have even more than one convection vessel. So inside the vessel like this, with water, you cannot have really com convection. Yeah. That's super interesting. Uh, and like Roto in the Twitch chat just said, the more technical, the better. Because uh, <laughs> the folks on the Discord have been doing like uh, really? dives on all of this technical and scientific stuff and that convection uh the thing you mentioned about thermal convection actually makes a ton of sense because one thing we found out is that uh smaller vessels aren't really that great for poor in particular because for some reason mm -hmm. the tea seems to really care about like 
getting enough heat so everything uh, gets extracted mm -hmm. and kind of maybe not necessarily like the bigger the vessel the better but there's definitely a sweet spot for uh yeah like pot or guy one size when it comes to poor yeah that's uh, that's an aspect and in fact actually in, in, uh, there is this european and american trend of using extremely more ish in teapot that is not is totally not done in china in china you see much larger ish, ish in teapot uh, not everywhere right if you go to chaozhou they really like small ones but usually they have no problem even with the 300 400 milliliter teapot while everyone in europe would say oh no that's too large mm -hmm. what they do they simply don't fill it all with water you don't we, we, you don't have to yeah. fill it all right um and another another aspect that uh, i was thinking about is that if you have a an ancient teapot a small and a large one and they are exactly one double the size than the other mm -hmm. you do uh, so let, let's pretend it's a sphere so you have it double the size the ratio between volume and surfaces is different so if you make double the volume, you don't make necessarily double the surface. And also when you make larger teapot, you have to use thicker walls, otherwise it is too fragile. And so also you have uh, much more uh, thermal inertia if you want to be technical. Uh, you know, I was once a thermal engineer, so I tend to, oh, <laughs> to like those okay. topics. And uh, uh, so you have more thermal inertia in your teapot. And when it cools down, it requires much more water to heat it up again. And when it is hot, it stays there longer. Uh, so this is another aspect. Another aspect is, um, especially when you really steep at very high temperature and your uh, and usually uh, is um, uh, how much loss heat you lose, especially for longer steeping. This is not applicable to very short steeping, just to uh, radiation because you lose a lot of heat just uh, to radiation. And the the larger the surface, the larger the loss. So that's mm -hmm. also another aspect. Uh, Ralph, from uh, who's watching via Twitch right now, is asking whether the uh, water you're using today, being different from what you've used before, might have an effect on how the tea tastes. If there's like, um, are you noticing it something? Could be, yeah. Well, it definitely would have. As a matter of fact, uh, I have recently drunk uh, in the past week at least uh, two, three times this tea, and exactly with the same water. Uh, it is uh, simply a filtered tub water. Mm -hmm. So uh, with exactly even the same filter, it is a large filter. So, it, you know, just within a few days, you don't, uh, the, the filtering power doesn't change. So that's not the case. But when I will finish with this water, I have uh, a bottle of spring water that I could use. And then maybe uh, would be a difference, which is here, uh, just, just out of the supermarket, basically. But mm -hmm. I, I seldom actually, but I, I don't like to buy water for steeping tea. Uh, not because it's not better, of course it would taste better. I, I think it is a little bit of a waste. And honestly, I don't have a car. I don't want to carry water all the way around. <laughs> yeah, that's that's entirely reasonable. And like, if, if the uh, tap water you're using is giving you satisfactory results, then there's no real necessity to buy other mm -hmm. water. Unfortunately for me, my uh, tap water has like 22 uh, Deutsche Härte, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm kind of forced to use other stuff if I want to taste anything at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here is also extremely strong. You cannot even drink out of the tub. Uh, um, I'm not now. No, I think there is there is a video I will do. I already I already filmed it, so I never you know when I already filmed the video, I never remember if it's already online or not. But I think mm -hmm. this one is not. And there I did an experiment actually directly using tub water for a reason that I won't tell you now. You will see the video coming out soon. And uh, <laughs> wow, it is uh, it is in play. You cannot really drink that water. It really it tastes like uh, swimming pool water. Uh, oh, uh, so it's yeah. like strongly chlorinated. Yes, yes. Oh. And by the way, there is a, uh, there is a question that uh, I'm reading here with Matthias' chat that probably comes from the YouTube uh, chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you ever drink Schupur? Do you like it? In what situation? So I think what is good <laughs> if we, if we, you know, see we both answer the question so that they get uh, uh, two perspectives about that. Uh, do you want to say something about it? Um. I feel like my perspective might be a bit more surprising, so I'll let you go first. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. 
So, do you ever dream show? Yes. So, to, just to, uh, to, to answer very shortly. Uh, yes, I do. Do you like it? I do like it. Uh, it doesn't mean that I like all shoe wear, but uh, there are some that uh, I like a lot. And in what situation? That's a little bit the most complex of the three questions because, um, wow, it really it really depends. I could say situation where I don't drink shoe wear. For example, early in the morning, very seldom. In the evening can come uh, relatively often so um, in that case i really like that uh, warming round uh, sensation that uh, especially all the shoe poor can have so that have this uh, this earthiness that reminds me of uh, um, beads i think in, uh, mm -hmm. in english uh, um, and i love beads so i really like this earthy taste mm -hmm. um, that when uh, associated with this warm feeling especially in winter actually um i like it a lot you know so siggy it's your yeah. turn um so for me it's it's kind of difficult because i've uh i've sort of gone through phases with uh Shopur. i started really liking it at first like when i initially got uh -huh. into poor then i stopped drinking it altogether which has been going on for the longest time and i still don't really drink it when i'm by myself but i'm currently like slowly in the middle of starting to change my opinion again mm -hmm. after getting let's say maybe a slightly better understanding of what actually constitutes like age and maturity in a poor and how mm -hmm. that relates back to uh the attempt of Shupua to recreate this whole uh, aged sensation because mm -hmm. yeah yeah I and think, actually even yeah. Yeah, go ahead go ahead because uh, i think one thing that might be fairly common in the like journey of the poor drinker is uh -huh. at least over here when you start out you are focused almost entirely on like how does my tea taste good what's the flavors uh -huh. and Shu does have some nice flavors but uh -huh. uh, the impression i ended up getting a while ago was that a lot of it is quite like samey there's a lot of earthy notes there's uh -huh. some type of sweetness to uh -huh. it and whatnot yeah but, i understand what you say yeah yeah and uh -huh. then as time goes on there are other qualities about the tea that one starts to appreciate so like texture mouthfeel uh -huh. uh, your like reaction to the tea how how it like makes you feel how the, the, the impact on your body, right? For example, yeah. in yeah. China, many people would drink shampoo rather than shampoo because they consider shampoo, especially when it is too young, being too aggressive to your body. Mm. And you have also to, in my opinion, you have to see also the way that sheng and shampoo, uh, the, the place that they have in history, is completely different, actually. So uh, shampoo as a uh, um, you can see the shoe is true that it was invented in the 70s right but but the fermentation process is much older you have a lot of different hey china the region that have a much uh, older history and people yeah. uh back uh, back a few decades ago would never drink uh, shampoo um young and raw so they would always uh, let it age it, it, it doesn't matter if you look at people that were drinking that in hong kong or we're drinking that uh, a bit later in Malaysia, in Taiwan, or even before the Hong Kongonese, in Tibet, and in the other um, foreigner region just around in China. All of this, all of the, all of this country, they were drinking an aged, uh, rough uh, kind of poor that uh, was very close to the shoe poor feeling that we have today. So um, then, when we, we there was this uh, start of the hype of poor. And basically, only about the start with the start of the new millennia, there have been uh, people interested in drinking relatively fresh uh, uh, poor. So it's a completely new thing. Uh, in fact, before there was even not uh, a definition for uh, how to call a fresh shampoo. It's, it's nothing that you can drink actually. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and I think this is also the reason why today there is this controversy still about where to place shampoo. Because it, yeah. you, you could say it is a hecha, um, but, um, but, but actually, 
it is not it has not it has nothing to do with all the other hr then you could say uh, it's not a hr but it becomes a hr after you have aged it for 20 30 years and then my question would be uh, why don't you call hr a 20 30 years old white people? <laughs> uh, right? Yeah. Or, or why you don't call HI 20, 30 years old green tea? Um, mm -hmm. Green tea has a very, very a processing that is very similar to shampoo. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard, right? And, uh, and I have been thinking about what to write in uh, uh, or what to say in, uh, in a video about uh, the difference between shampoo and green pour for quite some time now. I have already a script that I started writing. Okay. And that's why I just said, you know, at the beginning, <laughs> uh, write. I use the word writing because I always write down what I'm going to say in the video usually. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I've been working on that, you know, sporadically now and then for, for a few months already. And I'm not yet there. That, yeah. you know, I feel ready to film it. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's kind of a difficult topic, isn't it? Because yeah, like there's so much to say about poor, really. Um, and what was the topic we were on previously? I forgot to be completely. Well, it was a shoe poor. We were speaking about shoe oh, yeah. poor before. Uh, there was this question about shoe poor. And uh, before that, I think we uh, we were discussing about uh, the effect of different uh, dimension of tea vessels mm -hmm. on uh, on the taste. Um, but at the end, is also you have so many parameters that uh, it's very very difficult to say which is the best. At the end, it depends yeah. which is the best for you. And also, I, I'm sure that every one of you guys know that uh, I've experienced that feeling that you have been drinking tea for a while and then you are used to steep a certain tea in a certain way and you just stick to it. Like, I mean, we have an example, for example, Siki, you were saying 120 milliliters of water, I steep with seven grams of leaves, no matter which pour. So you, you get uh, uh, familiar with the steeping method that it meets your, meets your taste and you just stick to it. And uh, it is good because it means that you have experienced something in the past and it was a way that brought you there. But at the same time, it prevents you to experiencing something new. Yeah. And uh, so sometimes I like to take a break. I like my, if I am at home, I'm not here at home. If I am at my home, I like to drink uh, poor shampoo. I always keep it in my uh, favorite Asian teapot. That is the Duanni that some of you have seen in the videos. Mm -hmm. And um, there is no way out. I mean, if I am at home, I never steep a shampoo in a guy one because I love my Asian teapot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but now I don't have it with me and so I'm experimenting a bit and although I wouldn't go uh, for um, the steeping method in the future necessarily, I am actually discovering different aspects of the same tea. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I think it's uh, I think it's important like on the one hand to figure out what works for like me or for you personally mm -hmm. and then it's equally as important to, once you have that established, uh, be willing to branch out and try different things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. like, it's kind of step one and step two. Step one is establishing a functional baseline uh, to compare other things against, it, uh, to, uh, to compare other things to. And mm -hmm. then once you've got that baseline working, you can play around with basically anything. Different water, right. different teas, different uh, vessels, different steeping times and whatnot. Definitely, yeah, yeah. And then I like to experiment. I like also to drink. Um, when, when I invite people to my place to drink tea, I actually like to, um, if someone wants to steep the tea, because, uh, you know, he will certainly steep it in a different way that I did. Um, that's something that's not very common in uh, uh, in Gongfu Cha. If you invite someone, you would be the one preparing it. And usually mm -hmm. there is this tendency, I know my tea, I don't want to give it to you because you will prepare it improperly and then it won't taste good and you will <laughs> tell that the tea is bad. Um, yeah, I I don't care much about that, and I like sometimes you know to to let other people steep in the mm -hmm. tea and see uh, what uh, what comes out uh, of it. And I don't remember right now if, for example, I did that some in some video with Brian, 
about poor and Brian has a very different steeping technique than mine so mm -hmm. yeah uh, most of the time when I drink with uh, Jens and Ralf and uh, the Munich group mm -hmm. uh, it's often not the person who owns the tea who's preparing it I don't think yeah. that's necessarily like a conscious thing in our case mm -hmm. but uh, it's it's kind of nice to see your own teas being prepared by someone else and to see like how yeah, same, they end up tasting me, yeah. a bit different. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I see Siki that we have the same look. Yeah, <laughs> I think this is like the quarantine 2020 uh, yes, thing we've got going on the... here. That's the case, yeah. You you can tell actually when the quarantine is over uh, because uh, I will uh, I will shave. So that's uh, you can use that as a parameter. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's been going on for a while, but at least uh, we've we've still found ways to enjoy ourselves despite being stuck at home. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I have to say that personally, I am enjoying it a lot. Like. Uh, I mean, I don't like the situation and I, wa I hope that the war gets out of it as soon as possible. But as uh, concerns to me, I usually have to go every day in the office and here I am experiencing something new working from home. Mm -hmm. It's uh, working fine. Um, I, I am productive. Uh, I don't think that I'm wasting time. That was one of my fears in the past from working from home. You know, I will get distracted, but I set up my office and uh, you know i'm focused i do what i have to do and uh, and since uh, i i know that is not only something that will be over soon i just you know gave up all my hobbies and things that i usually do for example sport i said to myself you know what i stop i don't do sport now and when we when we go back to normal life i start off again and i see everybody that you know also the neighborhood that they are in front of the tv and they watch videos and do exercises and so and i'm saying you know what <laughs> it's, uh, you know, for once it's nice to to just experience something something different, yeah. Yeah, and like we we got to make the best of it, really. And now I'm curious, actually, I want to measure uh, how much water do I, I am I steeping because I think that the leaves here take so much room in the guy one. Mm -hmm. So it's like, is it fifty milliliters when it's empty? Right. Oh, so you're probably gonna uh, get like... I would say I would say 60, 60 oh, okay. when it's empty. So, okay, guys, guess how much uh, I, I, I took uh, everything out of it. Uh, how much water there is in the cup now? Yeah, let's uh, let's see some guesses here. Probably gonna take uh, a few seconds for them to catch up, but right. In the meantime, we can yeah. just uh, it helps you. You know, you can have a look at the enjoy at the, at the thing here. And then maybe it would be also nice to know from uh, everyone listening what you are actually drinking. I know that you guys have already written it in the chat, but either we speak with each other or we look at the chat is a little bit difficult. So if you can write it in capital letters, you know, write everyone to write in <laughs> capital letters what you're, what you're drinking. Until now, I was able to catch only the Ye Sheng from Linsang that uh, Gabriele is drinking. What everyone else is drinking. What is Jens drinking? That's a very good question. I I kind of have a feeling he might not be drinking anything right now, but we'll so I see. say that Jan says thirty-five millimeters, yeah, and uh, uh, I want you to be precise down to the second digit. So like uh, three, five, both numbers are not correct. So continue until until you get both, and I will start drinking in the meanwhile. Oh, Jens is drinking something. The uh, Nanoshan, and then. I unfortunately don't know that acronym. What is uh, Q? Uh, me neither. What is QX? Oh, uh, uh, like Qingxin? You have uh, Qingxin. Qingxin 93. I thought I have only in the past a Tieguanyin 93. Mm. That I know Matthias likes a lot. I don't know if it's that one that Jens is drinking. We will see when he replies. But guys, you have tried with 35 millimeters, 20, 60, 80, 100, 120. I saw a 45 before. Mm -hmm. I've got 40 uh, over here on Twitch. 
Fourth is right. It's four oh, zero. Nice. Uh, congratulations in that case to someone who's also called Jan, a very good uh, friend of mine. Ah, really? And I mean, today we have uh, it's not the, it's not the tea quiz, it's not the game. But by the way, if you guys are uh, online again tomorrow, uh, so Saturday afternoon European time, Saturday morning in our time, we will have uh, we will be both Matthias and I uh, streaming, and uh, we will be speaking tomorrow about the impact of COVID nineteen on our tea sourcing in China, major impact. One, one disclose any details today, it is the topic for tomorrow. But what might be interesting for you, and that we will do tea games all the way through the live streaming tomorrow. And it means Matthias and I will be drinking tea one after the other. And every time you guess what we are drinking, you win the tea, and along with the tea, a 20 euro voucher. Oh, wow. So, that's generous. Um, and you know, we will do maybe one and a half hour, two hours streaming. I will be drinking, Matthias will be drinking. Every time you guess right, we change tea, and it goes on. So, uh, and when's that gonna be tomorrow? At Three p.m. Available on our website. That's correct. Yeah, all teas that are available on our website, uh, and they are not, you know, thousands of teas. So it means you can always, you know, go there, have a look what there is on the website, and make your guess. Yeah, or uh, if you want to go hard so, mode, don't look at the website and just. Be right, yeah, an absolute legend. Or if you don't want us to run bankrupt tomorrow, <laughs> no, it, it'll be fine, I'm sure. And it, it, I'm sure it's going to be a fun stream tomorrow as well. And you know, I mean, I play, I play guessing tea all the time when someone else is tipping a tea. I never want to know what, you know. Sometimes I even ask someone else to pick up a tea because mm. I want to guess it. And uh, uh, and recently, actually, I got it wrong twice in a row, Ooh. exactly the same tea. <laughs> oh, uh, it was yeah. not my tea, but it was incredible because it was a Baozhong uh, from Taiwan that to me, it was really tasting like a Tie mm -hmm. And I mean, of course, the two teas have a lot in common. Uh, they have some of the few tea or Oolong tea that are very low oxidation, so very floral and aromatic. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't even not looking at the leaves, right? Because if you look at the leaves in the first TP, you would see that the Tianwan Yin is not completely open yeah. and the Bao Zhong is an open leaf. So in that case, I was completely blind, not even looking at the color. And both times I say Tianwan Yin and it was exactly the same Bao Zhong. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I really, I really like actually. So let's see what people are drinking here. So, um, Matthias, Matthias is drinking the Tianwan Yin 93, that is a tea that is no more online. And uh, I have even a hard time remembering where I sourced it. Oh yes, now I remember where I sourced that. And it's not from the Master Chen, that is uh, uh, the farmer from which we supply all our Asia Tianwan Yin today. And it's, uh, it's just, um, just, yeah, was sold out, but Matthias has still some, some small portion at home apparently. Mm -hmm. Then uh, Elena is drinking uh, Rogui. Uh, Elena is uh, is a Yancha Rogui or is uh, is a more modern Rogui from Taiwan? Where is that from? I guess it's a Yancha, <laughs> but I'd assume as much. Yeah. Um, what is the what are the Discord uh, so watcher drinking? On uh, Twitch, I'm seeing. One person drinking a 2018 Manjuan from uh, Crimson Lotus. Then mm -hmm. uh, Jens was talking about the Ching Chin 93 from a different vendor, as it turns out. Now that you say Manjuan, it reminds me of uh, another tea game, uh, if you want. Uh, yeah, we like to play tea games that I have done with the Colorado Tea Society. So when, when I'm in Colorado, we meet about once a month uh, and we do a tea gathering. And the topic of that particular tea gathering was only tea from Manjuan. So everyone mm -hmm. that had, I mean, it's something very specific, right? Maybe mm -hmm. some of you have even ever heard Manjuan, which is actually, it is, was one of the, um, sometime it is uh, accounted within uh, uh, one of the six famous mountains. Yeah. So it is a famous place, but nonetheless, nowadays it's not a hype place. It's not Laobanjang, it's not Bingdao, so it's not EU, so no one knows it. 
Um, but actually, um, so everyone brought the, that had a tone, brought a tea from uh, Manjuan. We had about the six maybe different teas from Manjuan. And the, the idea was, let's try to find out which is the common taste oh, of yeah. tea from Manjuan. Yeah. yeah. We didn't succeed. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't succeed. I mean, we tried different, and uh, they, they were just different teas. <laughs> yeah, mm. so it's uh... yeah, it's it's funny how that works, isn't it? Because like um, something I've been trying personally, and I imagine a lot of other poor enthusiasts have been trying as well, uh -huh. is to like make a mental map of flavors linked to certain areas, or maybe not necessarily just flavors, even general properties of tea, but. Uh, Basically every time there's at least a handful of teas that just don't fit into that at all. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. it is. It is. You can. It's very hard to generalize, right? Uh, yeah. But you can. You can actually, and there is certainly uh, an influence of uh, um, terroir in Yunnan that you can tell apart. And this is another topic that which is another script that is open, uh, open end probably, like I'm, that I'm trying to complete about uh, uh, the different type of uh, uh, poor terroir, just to help uh, especially uh, beginners. But I would say not only beginners, maybe to try to to make some order in this big mess that is Yunnan. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to say Yunnan is a country that. Uh, um, I mean, I, I, I don't know the numbers now, but I would say in size is comparable with the size of Germany. Uh, and uh, the population is, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure, higher. I mean, some of you can Wikipedia now, maybe I cannot compare the two countries and let us know. But my guess is that the size is fairly similar. Maybe Yunnan a bit smaller, I would say, but the population is higher. So is a lot of people yeah germany is the as the highest population in, in europe as a country and uh, uh it's, it's very difficult to make order in that especially when you drink six different tea from a single place manjuan and they all taste different <laughs> from each other and on top of that you add the complexity of gushu terras tea uh, of uh, uh, aged not aged uh, uh, yeah. it's a mess right and so trying like, to bring a little bit of order yeah yeah even like tiny differences in the processing method are already gonna have a huge effect on what the tea ends up tasting like mm -hmm. it's it's uh, there's a lot of stuff poor is an infinite rabbit hole that one can like plunge themselves down into okay. and never end up on the ground more or less and Matthias made the research, he's writing that the size of Yunnan province is a uh, little larger than Germany. So I was wrong, I was thinking it is uh, a little smaller than Germany, it is a little larger actually. And uh, what I read before here is actually uh, Helena is really drinking a Yencha uh, Rogui, so usually a fairly strong, uh, a fairly strong Yencha. Um, this is this Rogui, it's, by the way, this is another thing maybe for uh, we, we should speak about poor, but uh, since since Helen is drinking a rogue, we can talk about anything. <laughs> and uh, um, for me, rogue, if you have the question yourself, how can I distinguish different yencha from each other? It's a problem, right? Especially the classic ones. Uh, let's say you want to distinguish uh, uh, Shui Gui from Bantian Yao. Very hard. Very very hard. Especially also because the roasting is playing such a major role in the team. But you can start with Rogui. Rogui is the, the first Yencha that you should be able to recognize blind. And once you have done that, you can move on with the next. Because it has this it's very, very characteristic taste, actually. There are similar, though. Most recently, I had uh, a, a, a Yencha from a rare cultivar that is called uh, Shiru. Shi means uh, rock, not cliff, like Yen mm -hmm. means rock. Uh, which, by the way, is also a, a naming in China that they use also for other teas produced in uh, Sichuan. But that's a different story. <laughs> and Ru, I think, is another name for rhyme. Uh, um, wait, I'm not 100% sure. Let me think a second. No, it must be something different. I don't remember. Anyway, the name of the cultivar is Shiru, S-H-I-R-U, and is a very rare cultivar and it had this spicy note of rogu. 
So mm. Rogu is not really unique with that spicy note, but uh, uh, it's hard to get close to this taste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then here we had uh, we had um, uh, Gabriele that uh, switched to a uh, Liubao, which for me is a very good tea for late night. Yeah, I can imagine. It's uh... oh, and uh, I, I'm. See, yeah, mix the things around. Actually, Yunnan has 45 million people and Germany 83. I thought Yunnan had a larger population, but that's not the case. And of those 45 million, which is still, you know, as big as Spain, not even maybe larger, and um, are uh, you have like I think eight million of those, like yeah, 10 percent or uh, no more, 20 percent are actually in the capital in Kunming. Oh, yeah, but like even even then, like 43 million people in Yunnan and a lot of people there are making tea it's mm -hmm. it's a large country there's a lot of tea to find there it, it's and... large and is uh, uh is uh is large and it's, as we said it's even uh, slightly larger than Germany and Germany, Germany is a large country so and uh, uh, the um, transportation in Yunnan is not uh, as good so for example if you are in the and you have to go to Queen. Actually, really the fastest way is to take one-hour flight. Um, but if you want to go by a bus or train, you can do that, but it takes quite some time. And once you're in Kunming, when you want to go to in the north to places like uh, um, Dai, uh, so the, that direction, uh, direction of... Um, I'm thinking about some names, let me think. To Shangri-La uh, at, the, at the border, basically with Tibet and Sichuan, uh, that might be like a whole night in the bus uh, on roads that are not uh, as, uh, are not paved all the way through. So um, it's still, you know, it's not like a, a five hours train or even less nowadays from Berlin mm -hmm. to Munich, and you have crossed the country um, in five hours. Uh, you don't go very far. Yeah. So. Um, there is still a certain level of isolation, if you want, that contributes to uh, diversity. Yeah, so you mm. don't farmers don't very often meet other farmers oh. in different areas. You know, a, a farmer in Linsan uh, rarely make a trip and go down and go to EU to visit some people there, unless he has a larger factory and. Uh, um, yeah, he's interested in seeing how other people do things, but that's rather uh, rare. Mm -hmm. And usually it's just you know, a local exchange with other farmers, yeah. Makes sense, yeah. yeah. Um, responding to Trinke Uso in Twitch chat, uh, I assume that's either my friend Markus or maybe Tim. Uh, yeah. I am drinking some Shangpur from Gödeng right now. It's quite nice. Uh, I imagine we could have it together at some point. <laughs> and uh, um, I'm not so good at marketing, apparently. Matthias is reminding me that since we are speaking about Yunnan, I should mention I should mention actually a, a, a live workshop that we are going to do on the 9th of May. And um, uh, it is called The Taste of Yunnan. And uh, well, uh, marketing is, is, is relatively relative marketing actually because we, we don't really do money out of it. So uh, we uh, you can buy some samples in our shop. So uh, and we just sell that for the, the price of the sample. We would sell you send you six different samples, all these from Yunnan. And sorry about that, no no one on oh, one of those teas is poor actually. And uh, the reason is that. Um, um, Let's find out together if there is a common thread in the taste of teas from Yunnan. No matter if they are poor, white tea, black tea, green tea, is there something in the tea that uh, um, makes you recognize in that tea come from Yunnan and not from anywhere else? And this is the purpose of the, the workshop. So we're going to have uh, two white tea, two green tea, two black tea. For every type of tea, one is from Yunnan and the other one is from the east of China. Mm. And we won't concentrate about recognizing that one is a black tea and the other is a white tea. We will <laughs> check if there is anything in common between the three from Yunnan and that separate them from the other. And of course, uh, um, 
my personal answer is yes, there is something, and it's something that I have experienced firsthand when um, I had the opportunity to, to try some tea. And I, before even saying it is a poor or it is a white tea, the first thing that came up to my mind is Yunnan taste. Oh. So let's do this experiment. So if you want to do this experiment together, uh, you can do it, by the way, also with your own teas. Uh, if you have, uh, uh, you know, just different teas, uh, more so diff uh, and same type of tea, but from different places, Yunnan and other places. Um, otherwise, if you want to join us with exactly the same samples, uh, yeah, you find more information on uh, on YouTube. It's already in there and on our event page. And uh, I think it is seventeen fifty for uh, the six different teas, uh, seventeen fifty euros. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you happen to know off the top of your head what kind of teas you're gonna have there for uh, people yes. who want to join but maybe won't be able to order? Uh, the yes, pack. we have uh, uh, we have uh, so a classic uh, black tea from Yunnan, a classic Yan Hong, uh, and uh, so black tea was introduced in Yunnan relatively recently, if I'm not mistaken, at the end of the 19th century, and uh, um, we will compare that tea with an even more recent uh, uh, black tea, Jinjunmei from. Uh, from uh, Tomuguan, from the east of uh, um, China. Then we will have white tea, we have uh, Yue Guanbai. So we will have, ah, by the way, also, what we tried is to, to have, uh, so you have the two, the two black teas are both teas made from uh, um, buds, oh. from leaf, bud leaves, right? You have mm -hmm. Tian Hong, we took a Tian Hong made only with buds. Jinju Mei is a black tea made only with bud, so that we take one variable away, let's say. The same story for white tea. We have uh, two Injen, uh, so two silver needle. One, we have uh, um, um, Yue Guan Bai, silver, um, Yue Guan Mai, Yue Guan, uh, so um, Moonlight White. Mm -hmm. I was to think, I am used to, to think about the name in Chinese and have <laughs> to think about this one. So Yue Guan Bai from Yunnan, and the Baihao Ingen from Fuding. So two buds, uh, only bud tea, uh, white tea. And then we will have uh, a Yunsi as a green tea from Yunnan. And we will compare that with... Uh, hmm, do you remember? Uh, Matthias just Which, mentioned uh, with the uh, Nutty Longjing. Ah, with the Nutty Longjing, yes, with the Nutty Longjing. So uh, yeah, that's the teas that we have chosen for it. Yeah. By the way, um, maybe when you think at Yunnan, you don't think about the white and green tea, uh, while uh, um, it could even be that there are more green teas in Yunnan than poor. The, the, you would be surprised, it's just there is no market here, but you would be surprised by the amount of uh, white also, but you would be surprised by the amount of green tea that is produced in Yunnan. Uh, and you see... That's really fascinating because I mean, yeah, I, when I think Yunnan, I very much think poor for the most part. It is, yeah. And the reason is that uh, Yunnan people, uh, I mean, except for the past 10 years, but before that, they were never drinking poor. They were just drinking uh, green tea. Poor was for the export. Mm -hmm. So local people would drink green tea and they have a huge, a huge range of varieties of green teas. You go in a tea market, you get crazy on how different shapes you have, and um, very interesting in taste, very rich and savory. But uh, for some reason, there is no market, so uh, people don't, uh, uh, people, other shops, uh, and also Nanoshan, we don't really source a lot of green tea from uh, Yunnan because uh, uh, you guys wouldn't really buy it. So <laughs> if I am there, I buy it from myself because I like it, but there is uh, there is very little market, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like, Funnily enough, that would probably also mean that you could get some very, very good green teas from Yunnan for a comparatively low price. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All teas in Yunnan are relatively cheap, except for those hype poor like mm -hmm. Laobanjan and so on, depending on which is the current hype. But uh, um, that's also why, actually, in Yunnan, there is not the tendency of selling wholesale tea by uh, by one gin, one gin is half a kilo, 
because first of all, they are used to sell poor and poor is sold in much larger quantity of wholesale. And also because of that, there is this tendency to sell also other types of tea in relatively larger quantities. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, we were not able to buy also a very small portion of some specific loose leaf tea, but the mm -hmm. tendency is to sell a little bit larger quantities, yeah. Makes sense. For sure. So Jan, good night. I see that Jan is uh, is leaving. I can understand that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's yeah. getting late. It's <laughs> getting later. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Uh, thanks for joining us and uh, have a good Thank night. Thank you, Jan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, since we were talking about Nanoshan a bunch just now about the uh, workshops you're going to be hosting and stuff, how did you actually like get to the point of deciding I want to run a tea shop? What, oh, like, yeah. what made you decide to do that? So this is another thing that uh, um, that ran to me rather than the other way around. And uh, um, I actually, I did, I, once a, a customer asked that to do a video about uh, my story, my tea story, and I told him I will do it when we have, when we reach 1000 subscribers. At that time we had uh, less than 200. Today we have more than 700, so we are getting there. Mm -hmm. by the summer I will do that and um, but I can certainly share already a little bit of that story so I will put it this way um, it, it is not really my my main work and uh, my, my main job and so on and at that time uh, I was traveling a lot for work I had a lot of business trips because I was participating to a lot of conferences around the world and um, I was uh, when I discovered tea for the first time, uh, real tea, I realized that uh, good tea is not so widespread in the Western world. You know, you can take, for example, uh, let's think today about good coffee. You can find good coffee everywhere. Uh, oh, yeah. Good whiskey, you can find good whiskey, good wine. You can find bad and good wine. But if you if you're thinking about good tea and bad tea, the normal people, I mean, not us, right? Not the tea freaks, just the normal people, they are not aware that there is tea of better quality. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, especially at that time, it was quite some time ago, I'm speaking about like 10 years ago, it was, uh, uh, I, I, I wanted to spread the word of tea. And so what I did in combination with my business trip, I was taking with me tea and teaware, and in advance I was uh, contacting people to organize workshops and oh. seminars. So they were everything, you know, uh, no business, yeah, you know, no money, nothing. I was just, I was paying, sometimes I was paying, like I remember once in Sweden, I gave 100 euros to a cafe just to have a room for us. And in that room, I organized a workshop with 30 persons, mm -hmm. just giving, uh, uh, I, I had my conferences on Friday, and so I stayed over the weekend. And on Saturday, I was just giving, um, giving flyers in Stockholm <laughs> around in the afternoon and the next day 30 <laughs> people came and then we were Ooh. doing Gong Fu Cha and I was explaining what is Gong Fu Cha and so on and this has been done you know in many countries it's been done in, uh, in, in Sweden, in France, in Italy and um, at a certain point I realized that by going to China forth and back uh, it would be much better if I have a small business because I can buy larger quantities cheaper oh yeah yeah, and so I thought let's open an online <laughs> shop and then uh, uh, by chance uh, I will tell you that in my in the tea history of me video uh, but uh, for now let's take it as granted that by chance uh, it happened that I got the possibility of opening a tea house uh, in uh, Berlin mm -hmm. something that I really didn't have uh, uh, in mind uh, <laughs> but it just rushed to me and I pretty much decided to go for it yeah Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure it was a good decision, <laughs> but uh, but it happened, and uh, yeah, and here I am. Yeah, I'm sure it was a worthwhile experience, though. Oh yes, I learned a lot. Yeah, yeah. But you know, uh, running when you have a, when you have a, a tea house in the very center of Berlin, uh, despite the fact that Berlin is cheap, is still the capital, and also the yeah. the prices of the rents. Uh, for businesses is completely different than houses that can mm. be really really high downtown and uh, and you know I am I am I mean a tea lover I don't like to sell uh, uh, mainstream tea 
So for me, it was a no go to have uh, uh, blends, for example, like English breakfast mm -hmm. uh, or Earl Grey, that are those type of tea with whom even good, good quality tea shop make their money actually. Yeah. So I wanted only to offer tea that I was drinking myself. And uh, you can imagine that, as we said before, there are not so many tea freaks as us. And so it's, yeah. it's just a small group of people that you are addressing. And on top of that, uh, it's a lot of money to run such a shop. And uh, I had just to sponsor it with my own uh, savings, basically. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, I'm just, just to say it in a sentence, when you have a hobby that costs you every month more than your income, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, of course, you have an yeah. income also from that, right? But it's not something sure. Yeah. If you have, for example, COVID-19 two years ago and I have to close my tea house, I still have to pay my rent, I have to pay my employees, mm -hmm. and those costs are higher than what I earn. So uh, it's, um, it is a diff it's quite a, a responsibility and I didn't want to find compromises on, on quality just for the sake of surviving. Yeah, yeah. I, you know. I kind of feel like that's the, uh, that's the conflict a lot of like enthusiasts have to go through if they want to consider turning their uh, passion into uh, a form of labor because yeah. of course there's always certain uh, sacrifices to be made so to speak in terms of actually making it viable and yes huge yeah, yeah. when you don't want to make compromises then uh, yeah. things can get a bit more difficult right and I can tell you I mean I, I know of course other uh, person that are running tea businesses, uh, tea houses, and they tell it very clear to me, even if they are, you know, they have tea of the same quality as Nanoshan, they say 90% of our income is done with uh, Earl Grey, English breakfast, other Indian tea, and herbal tea, uh, fruits tea, and these kind of things, yeah. And I see a question here from uh, a, let me, a little, a little lemon test. Sorry to, to split that name. <laughs> uh, when you started out giving workshop Gong Fu style abroad, did you bring lots of teaware for yourself and guests in your suitcase? Um, yes, I did. So the, the advantage of uh, uh, being on a business trip is that the company is paying for the, for the flight and it means you are not flying EasyJet or uh, Spirits or other cheap companies, but you find normal flight companies and you can take a suitcase with you even if it is just for a day or just for the weekend. So I was always taking with me a 20 kilo <laughs> sweet case, but I have just a couple of clothes for me and all the bag was filled, literally filled with different teas, uh, teawares and cup. Mm -hmm. Luckily enough, Gonfu Cha doesn't take a lot of room. So. <laughs> yeah. We, we but of course, it, God. It, it requires, I tell you, it requires quite a lot of organization and uh, is a little bit stressful. I remember it was a little bit stressful, um, but it's just uh, it's just a lot of fun. And sometimes you can get uh, helps. Uh, for example, in France, uh, I'm while I was searching opportunities to give uh, uh, workshops in Paris, I came to know um, the tea, tea bloggers from uh, from France. Oh. And uh, uh, one is called uh, Te Evangelist, and uh, uh, so Te with an H, French wise, and then Evangelist. And, um, and uh, she uh, is uh, very popular in, uh, in France uh, with her tea blog, and she was also invited by large uh, tea companies in France. You know, that companies has a long tradition, which large tea companies, uh, Dunman Tea. Uh, Maria Freyers and so on. So mm -hmm. she was invited even by one of them because uh, they wanted basically her as uh, a way of sponsorship, so speaking, mm -hmm. her speaking about their tea. So um, she answered to me and we became uh, friends uh, also with uh, Alan, is another tea blogger from, uh, from France and they helped me organizing those workshops. So they were, you know, spreading the words in their community. I could use also their places sometime or they I could use the, their tea wear, their tea and this way we were able to organize in those workshops yeah it was a lot of fun I missed that in a way and um, 
Uh, now that uh, this is an disadvantage of not having a tea house, uh, I cannot really give uh, workshops. Mm -hmm. And I really like that. Uh, so that's uh, when it came the idea of doing these uh, live workshops online. Um, it's not 100% like real, but it gets close to it, right? Yeah, it's like it, it works fine enough. And like, honestly, in my opinion, I think it's a great idea because uh, on the one hand, you get the comfort of your own home, your uh, familiar tea wear yeah. and stuff. And on the other hand, you get that uh, shared experience with other people and yeah. learning about stuff. Definitely, definitely. And what we do also is that sometimes when I travel and I know I go in places where I have customers that I remember, then uh, I ask the customers if they want to organize an event. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, uh, in this precise way, uh, I'm also trying to organize actually an event uh, in Berlin. Next time I will be able to fly over. Um, of course, I have friends in Berlin, but uh, we have so many customers in Berlin that it would be nice to find <laughs> a venue large enough mm -hmm. to us to have everyone without having to spend a lot of money. And, and uh, I have one customer that is helping me in finding a, a venue for that. Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a small community and we try to help each other. And um, I think the, one of the, the reasons why I love tea is uh, because it's a social thing. So I really like to share. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this is the aspect I miss the most of uh, the tea house. Yeah, when, when, I, when I came over to the US, I had basically to close the tea house. Um, you can imagine it is quite hard to run a tea house in Berlin while you're <laughs> living in Switzerland with the full time job. Yeah. Uh, friends <laughs> with Berlin um, and you have anyway another job to care about. Uh, it was just a no go. Yeah, so I had to, to close that. Yeah. But I have to say I'm very happy with that because uh, I can spend more time for the online shop uh, and honestly doing both things at the same time uh, was simply too much for, mm -hmm. you know, for one person and since uh, now also Matthias joined the group um, it's, uh, you know, I have less work to do because I don't have the tea house I have Matthias that takes over a lot of my previous work so we are able, for example, to having a YouTube channel yeah mm -hmm. and i mean especially considering that like both you and uh, matthias also have day jobs that you work at yeah definitely yeah i said i just jumped off a call uh, uh, from work and i have to actually to close the call 15 minutes before it goes to an end um and uh yeah we both have uh other jobs we don't just make clear we don't live out of nanoshan at all <laughs> actually nanoshan that they live out of us and um, yeah, that makes everything a little bit more difficult. That's why also if you look at was when we are streaming, it is during the week, late in the evening, when <laughs> office time are over or during the weekend, yeah. Yeah. So uh, speaking of that day job, what, what do you do for work? What do I do you for You mentioned it's... you used to be a uh, thermal engineer. But is that yeah, that was the today? start. That was the start. So I um, um, actually at the, I was a thermal engineer at the very beginning, but I, I've always been working in the space industry. Uh, I um, I wanted to be when I was very very young. I wanted to become an astronomer, oh. uh, and then very close before going to university, I realized that it's very hard to find a job as an astronomer. I will end up being a teacher. Mm -hmm. or maybe working in a very remote place in an observatory and that time there was no uh, remote controlling of telescopes and mm -hmm. so i gave up that idea and i studied the uh, aerospace engineering just to have the my head in space basically and this is what i'm still doing today so i'm working for uh, uh for a swiss company that um and we produce uh, uh basically structures for uh, uh, rockets and satellites so and that's uh, what I'm doing, yeah. So what you're saying is basically that you have a very good excuse to use the term it's not rocket science. Right. Uh, anything yeah. that isn't literal <laughs> rocket science. Yeah. I can tell if it's not rocket science, definitely, because I do rocket science the whole day long, actually. Yeah. That's, that's very it. cool. And it's also, for me, it's a nice change. You know, I mean, um, space engineering is very different than drinking tea. Um, and by the way, I don't know you, but... Uh, this is another great advantage of working from home. I'm drinking so much more tea now than when I'm in the office, you know. 
And, and I, in yeah. the office, I still have my whole set. I have my Gong Fu just set, exactly the same kettle on the table. And there is a water cooler and water heater dispenser just next door. And nonetheless, because of thousand meeting and so, I, there are days where I don't have time to drink tea in the office. While here, I drink tons of tea. <laughs> Cheers. Yes. Um, yeah, for me, it's mostly been like... <laughs> With everyone staying inside, we've been having a lot of like uh, joint tea sessions and talks on the uh, tea Discord. So, uh, by that virtue, my tea consumption has already inc uh, also increased lately. Like, yeah. um, <laughs> the worst part is there's often kind of like two uh, shifts going on with like the Europeans being online and then the Americans being online late in the night. Yeah, and don't uh, tell me. I am. Um, Fortunate or unfortunate enough uh, to often yeah. also be part of those late night sessions, and then I end up drinking poor at like three in the morning, which is not uh, not a good idea. I wouldn't recommend it, but yeah, 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 I understand yeah. that. Yeah, yesterday evening I was drinking a lot of tea. I, I, yesterday was uh, a Yencha day, so I drank a lot of Yencha during the day, and then after dinner I say, okay, I want to try another one because I like to taste different similar teas in the same days for comparison and uh and i was saying yeah you know it's not a problem because anyway yancha is roasted so you have less caffeine in it and so but as a matter of fact i woke up in the middle of the night at 3 a.m and then i couldn't continue really sleeping <laughs> i don't know if it is because of that because usually i don't have really an issue but mm -hmm. uh yeah that was the situation uh, yesterday night <laughs> <laughs> it happens yeah um it a happens, little lemon yeah. test is asking would you ever give up space engineering to go full time into tea? Never. No, it's uh, and uh, and also the other way around. Yes, I am a full time uh, in engineer, and uh, um, you know maybe in the future I might consider going to like eighty percent. Uh, why not engineering? But I could never leave uh, my engineering part. You know that's what uh, I've done all my life uh, in the sense that when I was twelve. Really, when I was 12, I decided to study astronomy at university. I changed my mind when I was 18, just shortly before going to university. And, uh, and I've been working all my life in space uh, and it's a portion of me that I cannot leave. But at this point, uh, I also cannot do only that because mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe I like, in one way, I like a lot multitasking, uh, not necessarily two things at exactly the same time, but um, when you have a eight, nine hours day in the office, if in the evening I would have a second engineering job, it would be very hard. <laughs> but when you switch completely and you do tea, mm -hmm. you, you, I mean, at least I find complete new energy. And sometimes, you know, I, I wake up at 4 a.m., I work a three hours tea, then I go in the office, eight hours in the office, and then in the evening I do another two, three hours of tea. And it's fine, I can do that. Uh, and. Uh, People that keep on saying to me, you will get a burnout, uh, I tell them, you know, I opened Nano in 2014, <laughs> right? <laughs> we are in yeah. 2020. I, think, I mean, I think in that sense, maybe, uh, I guess it also kind of goes into the idea of like what actually is work, but it seems quite clear that to you, uh, running Nano isn't the same as doing normal work and that you're, uh, no, no, you're actually really. having fun no. with it. Would you say that? You have fun with it. It is, it is a lot of commitment. So um, I'm sure Matthias can confirm when uh, Matthias have a whole day. Um, Matthias is a lawyer, is a different job, but I mean, it's also quite time demanding. And when you come back in the evening at home, like at 7 p.m. and you have woken up at 6 a.m. in the morning and after dinner, you have to sit down and process 10 orders. Mm -hmm. And we write personal letter to each of you, as you know, it's a lot of work, but uh, you know, in a way, you have to dis. I, I have to decouple um, doing a lot of work with uh, not having fun. That's two different things, yeah. right? You can be very tired of doing something, and nonetheless having fun doing it. And uh, and that's the way the way it is for me. Um, I'm certain you also have a lot of energy, and people keep on saying that. I, I'm sure that not everyone is up to spend uh, so much time and energy for having two jobs at the same time. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, it's working fine. And uh, as you said, it's not a real job also because uh, um, 
I mean, honestly, Dan Ocean doesn't really bring a lot of money, actually doesn't bring money at all. It, it's just a hobby. Uh, we do it for fun. And uh, our reward is actually, uh, for example, because of Nano Shan, I can travel to China every year and I have an excuse to explore and find tea. It would be very hard to do the same experience because how I convince a farmer to spend <laughs> time with me if I'm just a private person. Yeah. But if I have a tea shop and he has an interest in me, then I have a reason for, you know, make a new yeah, connection uh, and uh it, it, it's so, an easy way to get some uh guanxi yeah yeah exactly yeah and in the same way is also a uh, very rewarding when you see that you spread the word of tea so especially also now with the youtube channel or before with the tea house you have people that just pass by the tea house mm -hmm. aesthetically are attracted to it they enter and they discover a, the, a new world the world of gongfu tea or you can have um you can have someone, you know, just searching for tea on YouTube and then they discover our channel and they realize the tea is different than what they thought before. Or you can have people like Sigi that is already very much into tea and is searching specific information and then anyway, it ends up to our channel and we, uh, we, we like to establish a connection with the customers. So as uh, some of the people that I see also now online, um, like Jan, like Ward, they have just recently become our customer but I know them by name and uh, uh, I wrote them letters. It could have been Matthias knowing letter. I'm not saying that I remember the name of each of you. Uh, I think we are now at more than 800 customers, but uh, um, we know most of you actually. And uh, and these, uh, when you write back to us, that's the master is when we start also remembering you. Mm -hmm. Because as long as we, you know, See what I mean? As long as it's only we writing and we don't get feedback, it's hard. But when we start getting a feedback or as having an email of someone asking, which tea do you suggest? Like, for example, you know, before having my own business, I would never go to a, a, a businessman and asking me, which tea do you suggest me to buy from your shop? Because I would have the impression he would tell me what he wants to sell and not what, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but now, being on the other side, I have a completely new perspective. You know, if you come mm -hmm. to me, you send me an email and you tell me, which is your favorite tea on your shop I want to buy? I will tell you which is my favorite tea, you know, I don't have any other reason. Uh, and I like actually people, you know, searching that uh, level of consultancy, mm -hmm. if you want. Yeah. yeah? And yeah, especially in Europe, it's hard to find. I mean, I think that's like... I can definitely agree that that's a like major source of joy and motivation from uh, doing what you do, because it even if it's technically work, you get to have like a genuine connection with the people you're engaging with in the context of your work. So yeah, like writing these letters, talking to people, yeah. and that in a way, regardless of like the monetary exchange is is a lot of what makes it satisfying probably definitely definitely yeah and for me really also the, really the connection with the customer is one of the most important aspects now we have just fausto that have just joined uh, he's from turin in italy and we don't know personally each other it just happened that the, a, a friend of him uh, giovanni uh, and they are in the same uh, gongfucha group in turin uh, he contacted me some time ago on instagram Mm -hmm. So I also never met Giovanni, but for example, Giovanni wrote me just today an email because he saw our last video about the Yencha geography and uh, he had some uh, article to suggest to me for reading. Oh. So, uh, and, and he's actually just a customer, right? So it's, uh, um, you know, you establish this kind of friendship, even if actually with people that you don't really know and, uh, and you, are, you are happy when, uh, when people react. Like now, Matthias just wrote me, Fausto is also back online. And, uh, and of course, Matthias knows who is Fausto and I know who is Fausto. Matthias never spoke yeah. to Fausto, but, uh, <laughs> but since I spoke with Matthias about Fausto, you know, there is yeah. this, all this connection. It's, and, uh, like it, it's really kind of the same reason why I vastly prefer uh, Discord as a platform compared to like Facebook or Instagram. Because mm. if there are people I want to talk to directly and I want to hear like opinions from, then I can go on Discord yeah. and I can talk to them. Whereas it might be a bit more difficult or like 
they might be a bit harder to reach on Facebook or on Instagram because people yeah. don't use that as much to directly talk to each other. Definitely, definitely. And uh, it's also hard to find, uh, I want to say one more thing about that, it's also very hard to find, uh, um, uh, how to say, Hindla? Vendor? Mm -hmm. Vendor, vendor friendly uh, platform online. That's true, um, yeah. Yeah, you have the tendency that uh, when I'm joining a platform, it can be a Facebook group, it can be a, a forum online, uh, there is always a certain level of aggression, like being aggressive towards uh, the vendor, like, oh shit, he's coming in now and he wants to sell <laughs> us something, he wants to do marketing. Every, ta every time you say something, it's always because you want to sell something, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, there, is not, uh, there is not the recognition. And I say, I'm not really a businessman, right? I mean, I work, I take my money from a company and I work as an employee in the office, like most of you. And when people see me as a vendor from Nanmarshan, it's really annoying because uh, it's not that, you know, it's uh, um, yeah. you want to share something, yeah, and there is always, you know, this, this label that they put on you, a marketing you want to sell, is not selling the truth, it's not giving, and, uh, and it's very hard. And that's one of the reasons why I stopped participating in a lot of this forum and so, mm -hmm. because, uh, yeah, because it just pissed me off. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've kind of noticed that there's, um, especially in the, let's say, older platforms like the T forums you were talking about, there's always this kind of air of suspicion, which I guess isn't entirely unfounded because obviously it would allow yeah. people to do. But in my opinion, a much better way to go about it is like people are going to be excited about new products from the vendors they like and they, they're going to want to hear about yeah. it. So why not allow the vendors to talk about them on your platform while also this, benefiting right, yeah. from the like knowledge and experience they bring? To because the this is also a, a good point that you bring, actually, you know, everyone is against the vendors, but uh, would you be into tea without the vendors? How do you get your tea from? Yeah. Nowadays, you can order from China, of course, then that's not a problem. But even in China, they are vendors, you know, it's exactly yeah. the same story. So it's uh, um, there is this, I say, this anger against uh, uh, people that do tea business. Um, although actually every of us, because I am a customer as a vendor, every of us have that passion because we came in contact with some vendors. When I started, you know, going into tea, I was starting searching for better and better teas. Mm -hmm. I would have no chance to, um, to get the, to improve my uh, knowledge and my interest in tea without uh, uh, the vendors that I met on my way. And I have to thank one tea house actually in particular for uh, that gave me the opportunity to really understand what is tea and give, gave me the stimulus and uh, if you want the, yeah, the push to, uh, to travel to China myself basically, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, I have to say for me, if you tell me why I fell in love with tea, since this was a question before, one of the reasons I should definitely mention is because of the vendors. Yeah, yeah um, it's like, yeah, it, it, it's kind of, it's more about, uh, it's, it really depends on like the person themselves. Of course, uh, some people are going to react badly to like, marketing and that kind of stuff and that's where some anger can come from but like realistically speaking for instance like the the discussions we had today like you've you've told people a lot of stuff that's really interesting to know about like the um about the thermal capacity of heat uh, of teapots about various things you've experienced in china that most of us just sitting here and having tea would never have had access to if it hadn't been for the mm -hmm. opportunity of getting to directly talk to you. Yeah, and I have to say in the same way, I would actually like to have that interaction like in the forums, in the chat and so on, because although of course I have quite some experience because I've been traveling the past 10 years every year to China, and I have, you know, I, I know hundreds of farmers and so on, but nonetheless, the world of tea, we said just before, if you think about the size of Yunnan, it's so complex mm -hmm. that many of you have a specific field, more knowledge than I, right? 
like uh, a city might come up with the name of a place in Yunnan where he has a poor front that maybe I never heard or have already forgotten and so. So it's this level of exchange that if you want, I miss a little bit because uh, I could participate as uh, a, a private person on a forum, but it's not fair. And in some forum, and in most of them, it's actually forbidden. If you have a business, you cannot participate as a private person because yeah. your experience, my experience with tea is 90% of my tea is with the tea that I bought during my tea journey for Nano Shan. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, of course, I also buy from others, but as I was actually mentioning to Fabio, that by the way, parenthesis, Fabio joined Discord just this morning. So you see, we oh, have a connection cool. between Discord and YouTube, that's good. So when you travel to, to China yourself and every year you have the opportunities of meeting tons of really very good tea shops, farmers, direct sourcing and so on. Why should I really order from another shop in the US or in Europe? I do it from yeah. time to time, maybe because my girlfriend does or because I do just for out of curiosity and so. But uh, as I was saying to Giovanni and Faltas uh, weeks ago, I have very little experience of my competitors, if you want, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, first of all, we are not very much interested in doing uh, um, competitors oriented marketing and so on. Uh, second, even if we would be interested in that, we don't have the time for it. So you know much better than I what is out there mm -hmm. in the in the European market, on the US market. That would be also interesting for me, for sure. But I stopped participating in all of that, uh, and uh, it is uh, it is a pity for me because it's also um, uh, I, you know it's a portion of the yeah. tea world that I miss. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if you're missing like the the actual discussion of stuff and maybe some in depth talk about topics, then I definitely mm -hmm. encourage you to. Uh, start being active on the discord because in my opinion we really have a place there where people like are extremely interested in learning about yeah. stuff where vendors aren't like stigmatized and yeah. where people really just want to learn and hear experiences mm -hmm. and ex exchange like their knowledge and stuff it's it's really a great I, time on there i should definitely do that and in fact now i'm reading also in the youtube chat there is a uh, yodze uh yodze by the way, means pomelo, I think. Uh, Yodze. Maybe Yodze can tell us something about his name. I think Yodze means uh, uh, pomelo, the fruit. And he's writing that actually this court is quite, uh, um, it's quite, uh, um, how to say, friendly. Yeah, friendly. Welcome. Friendly. I mean, I live in the US and still uh, German words pop to my mind all the time. Although I'm not German, it's a big mess here. So Yodi is writing, Gabriele, please put an end to the discussion of silver teapots and heat retention. We really need a thermal engineer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Yodi seems to be a person living or traveling far from home, according to my mouse over dictionary. <laughs> Yodze, but he wrote another, uh, I mean, Yodze can be written in many different ways. He yeah. wrote in the, well, I cannot now do my search myself. Uh, it means a wandering person far from home, okay. I mean, the word yo, certainly, maybe with a different character, is also into the word pomelo, but yo can mean many things, right? Yo yeah, no, means also possession. Yeah, there's also the... Uh... What's it called? Like, isn't it also fried something? Because there's like Yotiao and uh, Yobi. Yotiao? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, honestly, I don't know really a yeah. lot of Chinese. Uh, but I mean, Yo, I mean, the most the most common use for Yo, I'm 100% sure, is the verb for possession. Mm -hmm. uh, you could say the verb have in English, although Chinese don't have the verb yet. But if you if you say uh, wo, wo myself wo yo something it means I have I possess something. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's uh, that's the, certainly the most common use. But they say I don't know about the accent and so on. Anyway, that's mm -hmm. a different topic. So um, CJ, I don't know about you, but uh, last time I was 
in the toilet was quite some time ago and I've been drinking a lot of tea. Yeah, we, we have indeed been drinking for quite a while now. We're uh, getting right. close to two hours. <laughs> yes, and uh, Matthias is also writing, he has to go to bed soon okay. and uh, I, I can understand that. And tomorrow I have still to prepare the workshop yeah. a little bit for tomorrow. Oh, right. Yeah, I probably shouldn't keep you for too long then, yeah. No, no, that, that's fine. You know, I just watched now at the time and I didn't realize that we have been speaking for two hours actually. Um, yeah, me neither. I, I checked yeah. like five minutes ago and then I was like, a minute and 45, uh, an hour and 45 wow. already, Jesus. Yeah. Um, that's a lot, yeah. Yeah, but... That's a lot. So, well, I think we can, basically, we can, what do you think? We can bring it to an end and if you guys like this level of interaction and so, we can have it other times so we can find maybe a way also to take a little bit more attention to your question. But sometimes we have uh, we have Matthias here that work for us and pop us which question you say, so that helps. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, uh, I don't know, I give the word to you, Sigi, and uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely conclusion. let uh, me know if you guys would be interested in seeing, uh, on the one hand, more streams with uh, Gabriel in particular or uh, maybe even Matthias or both of them at once even if we want to be ambitious uh and we can let try me know, let me know if you want to see more uh, like group streams in general i mean i've i have a bit of time now so i could set these up every once in a while yeah and uh in my personal opinion it's been a lot of fun today i enjoyed myself i hope chat i agree enjoyed yeah. themselves too we had some good tea we had some great talks and without any preparation like we didn't know yeah. what to talk about basically but apparently we got a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of ideas but at this point i mean actually the reason the main reason why i have to stop the video is that if i don't rush to the restroom <laughs> i cannot drink anyway yeah. any more tea okay I'm, I'm gonna decant this uh, last steep and then uh i was asked to say a bit about the tea um, okay. To be but you know what? Honest. While you say yeah. something about the tea, I run to the restaurant. Okay. That <laughs> sounds good. So, uh, about this tea, to be completely honest, uh, it's basically steeped through at this point. This final steep has maybe a, a slight hint of the flavor that used to be there. Uh, I mentioned a few things earlier in the stream where getting is of particular interest to me because it combines the uh, pleasantness, the like sweet roundness, the comfort of a typical Ewu profile with a bitterness and a certain complexity that the lighter Ewu teas can often be missing. So on the one hand you get some really cool, fruity, sweet, flavors it's a highly aromatic tea and on the other side you get that bitterness to really make it interesting there's some minerality in there as well of course it more or less has the hallmark of a tea that stays interesting across the whole session which to be completely honest not every tea does uh, yeah, Zams, that one was from Jay, the, uh, Gudding Dragon Balls. And even on this extremely late steep, like, honestly, the stream is making it look more colourful than it really is, I'm still getting that aromatic intensity. Definitely not as strongly as in the earlier steeps, of course, but I'm... I'm still getting that, you know, that feeling where it kind of seems like you can smell the tea while it's inside of your mouth? That's still what I'm getting, and that's one of the big draws towards this particular tea for me. It's something I've personally come to associate with, like a good quality, ready to drink younger Shang. Not all of them are gonna have it, of course, but this one certainly. I am back. Welcome back, Gabriele. Uh, some others I have also do. Uh, yes, Jens, I think we did try this one together once. Uh, maybe we could try it again at some point. But... Yeah, I don't remember what you uh, and Ralf thought of it when we did have it. But it's a tea I've 
been enjoying for a fairly long time now. Oh yeah, uh, how about we, like I just got done with my tea recap for this session. Uh, how about you recap the tea you had, or like maybe the tea experience rather, since that's kind of more what you were going for this time. Yeah, it's, uh, I said it was really um, something different. So what I liked of it is that it is a tea that I know very well. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, there's a long story because this tea actually uh, was bought privately a few years ago. I was drinking it for a year. I really enjoyed it drinking during that year. So the, the next year when I went back to China, I found a way of sourcing it again and offering also on the Nanoshan shop. But I never steeped it uh, in this way as I did today. And it's fascinating that uh, it tastes very really different. Like I would never guess it is actually the Bingdao 2013 because I, I usually don't experience this tea as being bitter, as being uh, mineral, yes, but not so not earthy. And it has some earthiness at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it gave me a completely different feeling. Very strong indeed. And as you see, yeah, it's a lot of leaves. And you see also, I have been steeping it for very long time and it has still a lot of power mm -hmm. so yeah it was it was an interesting uh, experiment i like to do the experiments would you say it would be worth uh preparing this tea in this particular way again uh i would say for me is enough like i've experienced it i've experienced something new i would do it only maybe on a very hot summer day when i want that uh, strength feeling Mm -hmm. Then I would do a brew being now this way because it brings me a little bit that uh, uh, chachi that uh, is usually more found in um, uh, in tea from the southern of Yunnan. Mm -hmm. So yeah, is a way of is a way basically to transform the tea according oh. to your mood and need. So, right. Uh, so so maybe if you like if if that's all you have on hand poor wise and you want something that's closer to like a bulang type tea rather than a, a linsang type tea right. you might do it this yes. way right so the the chachi of bingdao is is more a deep one yeah it's, it's more subtle and deep and large while the the chachi from bulang is more you know up from you drink <laughs> and it's like but it's very much here and these are Maybe if maybe a Chinese would say is a way of bringing uh, Bing Dao from here to the mouth, so you have oh. more strength in the mouth. Yeah, that's an that's an interesting way to put it. Yeah, <laughs> it it does sound like a cool experience though. Um, if I yes. if I ever end up trying that one, I'll see if I can maybe reserve a part of it to also try doing that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but I think we are just about ready to wrap it up today. We've been going for almost two hours. Um, yeah. I'm I'm sure your tea still has some power left in it. Mine is <laughs> entirely dead by this point. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. But I probably will uh, um, we'll go for uh, dinner now. And then after dinner, we'll do another tea. And with that tea, I, have, I will choose a tea that inspires me for preparing tomorrow's live stream. You know, it's like, Sounds like a I always, you know, want to associate the tea together with the activity I'm going to do. So mm -hmm. now it was good to have some strength, you know, during a live session. But when you want to prepare a live session, you want a different attitude, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you once again for joining me. This uh, was a lot of fun. Thank you. See you. In the and to those of you watching, if you're around, don't forget tomorrow, uh, 3 p.m. German time. That's 9 a.m. East Coast, USA, I think. Correct. There's going to be a live workshop from Nanwushan about uh, sourcing tea in yeah. times of the pandemic. So if that's something right. you'd be interested in, uh, don't forget to head over to their YouTube channel, which you can find under Nanwushan. And... Uh, and we have a lot of tea games tomorrow for you, so yeah. you can win tea and you can win voucher. So you want to come in, guess the tea and bring a tea back home. Yeah. And uh, one particular advantage for those of you joining from uh, the US, Nanwoshan has impressively cheap shipping to the US compared to a lot of other uh, vendors. That's true, yeah. It um, might not be true as you will find out tomorrow during the COVID-19 time, <laughs> as some uh, customer had already experienced. 
I will tell you more about that tomorrow, but we have ways to send you uh, half, half to half a kilo of a parcel, half a kilo parcel where you can put a lot of tea in it for just uh, $5.50. Um, of course, we take over some of the shipment costs in that, but still, I think it is uh, very fair. It is more, it is actually the same price that we offer to send the uh, to Italy. So, <laughs> so yeah, I think this concludes our stream. Like I said, if you've got time and you're interested, don't forget to tune in tomorrow. I'll, uh, of course, try to make it as well, and maybe we'll all see each other there. Right, yeah. Thank you very much again, Sigi, and uh, I'll see you either tomorrow on the next uh, or on the next uh, live streaming together. Yep. Goodbye. And bye, guys. Thank you for watching. Bye bye. <laughs>